Thank you. Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for your time and your service. Um, I wanted to take the uh, moment um, and just ask uh, Mr. French, just because we're on firefighting and this isn't reflected to a specific bill, but I, I had to get into a long discussion, which has led to several other discussions with uh, amateur fire theorists um, um, around the uh, Smokey the Bear issues, you know, how have we made our, fire, our forests more susceptible? Uh, but I also read 20 years ago a book called The Big Burn by Timothy Egan that talks about the fire of, of 1910, I believe, long right. before Smokey came into, a matter of fact, the, the cause of Smokey the Bear, the National Forest Service, by, by most accounts. Anyway, so that, at that time, there had been no, it, all the natural burns had been going through, and yet they had this uh, pernicious drought and, and had a, a, a fire that was literally unlike anything we've even seen today. How does that get explained in terms of modern fire theory? Well, I, I mean, okay, I really appreciate the question because, I mean, I think sometimes we make these issues too black and white. The reality is, is that most Western forests, especially dry forests, um, burned in a regular fashion. And there were periods where you might have significant drought, such as the time that led up to the big burn in Montana that created large-scale fires and large-scale devastation. Probably wasn't felt as much because you didn't have as much development and urbanization as we do today. That's one of the significant things that changed. We live in much more concentrated centers in and around our forest than we did before. We've been very successful at suppressing fires. We suppressed 98% of our fires in the first 24 hours. Um, actually, it might be the first 48 hours, but it's one of those two. Um, but that has had this other effect, and that is, is that forests, especially forests that had frequent fire cycles, most of your Sierras, a lot of the Rockies, especially Ponderosa-dominated forests, not necessarily some of those places you might find in Alaska, but they have grown and grown and grown. Forests that normally would have been thinned by fires that typically maybe had you know, 40 to 60 trees per acre now have 400 to 600 trees per acre. So when fires burn now, they burn at intensities that take out everything. You add climate change, climate change amplifies the effect of our own management that have created today's conditions, and that's resulting in a wildfire crisis. Got it. I appreciate that. And I, You're welcome. I will, some, someday I'll chase you down and we'll have a long, you know, as a governor for eight years, and we, we had several of the worst wildfire seasons in the history of the state. Uh, and, and it is obviously a multivariate uh, equation and, and not easy, but that's for another time. Thank you. Uh, you bet. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. Heinlein, over the course of uh, 15 years, we've had counties, farmers, whitewater advocates, uh, conservation groups, water managers, the uh, Ute Mountain Utes um, down in the southwest corner of Colorado, all working together. Uh, to create the Dolores River National Conservation Area and Special Management Area Act, which you've heard a little bit about already, uh, from Senator Bennett. Uh, he has been was engaged in the efforts to develop the bill, and I'm glad to join him and co-sponsor him, co-sponsorship with him um, and support the legislation today. Um, I think it really is a bill that strikes a balance, protecting close to 70,000 acres of public lands in Colorado, uh, including some of that beautiful Red Rock country that is uh, all along the Dolores River, or most of the Dolores River. Uh, and this bill also respects and protects uh, historic water rights um, and other historic uses. uses. Uh, the broadly supported solutions in the bill offer a perfect example of Coloradans from across various interests, across parties, coming together to share, the word I always used to use is topophilia, a love of place um, that really helps make our state and so, many, so much of the West so beautiful. Uh, can you tell me more about how the NCA designation actually is going to help the BLM manage these lands uh, and how the BLM would continue to work with local stakeholders that have helped get us here? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, maybe I'll just start with the second piece first. So, um, you know, broadly the BLM recognizes the importance of locally crafted conservation solutions um, and recreation, uh, focused on conservation and recreation areas on BLM managed public lands and waters. And we believe that's the most effective and enduring uh, conservation strategy um, 
considering the priorities, the needs, and the perspectives of the families and all of the communities, tribal interests that you mentioned. So absolutely, we, we, we find over and over those are the best and most enduring solutions. So we certainly support that and, and how this bill has been developed. Um, specifically, um, the, the National Conservation Area uh, designation on, on BLM managed lands would, it would enhance our ability to manage many of the resources that you touched on. Just the setting, the Red Rock Canyon setting with the Ponderosa Pines within it, which is so unique in that landscape, the broader landscape when, when you pop up out of the canyon into the working farmlands, um, it makes it so unique. Um, and, and specifically, some of the other conservation values, the fisheries, the whitewater rafting, um, the, the industry of that, the recreational use of that. Those are just a couple of examples that this bill and the designation would really help and enhance us with our management of. Great. Thank you very much. I yield back.